Hello all, I'm Ali. I'm a developer advocate at the Filecoin Foundation, which works closely with Protocol Labs and IPFS. Uh, and super psyched to be here today to chat about our vision here at Protocol Labs and the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, and to also help you build, I wanna show you uh, the tooling and dev stuff that you need to get started with building with IPFS and Filecoin. And I'm genuinely excited um, about the tech and I hope I can impart that with you as well. I know Patrick has shared some of his love of IPFS in some of his previous videos and hopefully I can just expand on that knowledge here. Um, so firstly, uh, to the vision and concepts. Um, so recently I heard a talk by Juan Benet, who's the founder of Protocol Labs and the Filecoin Foundation. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me was he said this line, that the properties of the internet and its technologies define our human rights. And that's honestly never been more true than it is today, where all of our kind of interactions um, happen digitally. Um, so, you know, if that's banking, is that social interactions? Is there censorship on that? Uh, can we do that in an easy way? Um, so this is really something that is defining our human rights more and more these days. And, and this is the vision that we share here at Protocol Labs. So we want a vision for the underlying technology of the future to provide a trustless system that enables the values of fairness and empowers ownership of your own data. So we believe in an open web that gives people ownership of that data. And that means it's portability, it's shareability, it's access accessibility, that's a hard word. Um, and this is really what drives us at Filecoin Foundation and Protocol Labs. Um, we're aiming to make breakthroughs in computing to push humanity forward uh, for the common good as well. So this is a mission I'm genuinely here for and one of the reasons I'm working in Web3 as well. Um, so thank you, Obi-Wan Bene. <laughs> anyway, so the big piece, one of the big pieces of this decentralized web stack puzzle though, uh, for the Web3 advocates in the room, is how do we store data in a way that aligns with the original values of the internet um, and the open source movement that came after it? So this essential data piece is really one of the core problems that IPFS and Filecoin are aiming to solve. And it's important to note that we're not just solving it for the Web3 world either, but we're also providing new solutions to traditional traditional uh, technology businesses also. Um, because traditionally the current Web2 model is, is centralization. So there's only a few companies that are offering storage, so Microsoft, Google, Amazon, IBM. Um, and several of these centralized companies have access to our data via our social media profiles profiles or and use this as the basis of their business model. Um, and this leads to several issues. The first one's a lack of security and portability around our own data. So uh, these kind of social uh, entities are hacked constantly and our data is leaked or they're used for nefarious uh, PSYOPs missions. Um, and the second that is that if any of these centralized storage systems fail, which we've seen happen countless times, then entire services go down. So to solve this, you could start with microservices, uh, maybe use uh, Red Hat uh, on your Kubernetes containers, so OpenShift, and, but then you're already creating like a multi or hybrid cloud environment. And by that point, you're diving into decentralization to distributed systems already. And that's just for resilience. And it comes with massive engineering and financial overheads. So it really led to the question, why aren't we designing the web for the autonomy and resilience we need in the first place? Um, the original mission of the internet to be an open place for knowledge sharing and collaboration and for the benefit of everyone. Um, and that's something that's becoming more apparent that we need to keep working towards. Um, so let's explain some of the technologies that we've rolled out as part of this mission. So firstly, IPFS, which I know Patrick has uh, spoken to you about already, so I won't uh, linger here too long. Um, so let's start with the name, IPFS. Cue the Star Wars theme, Interplanetary File System. So this isn't just a meme name though, because it's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network for files and folders. And it was designed to be able to work even when the network is between planets. Um, so maybe you're thinking, well, this is just a fancy story for another peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, but there's real gravity, get it, <laughs> in what it does because IPFS is distributed and it also has a really unique way of, um, moving content around. So it's unique because rather than using methods that we're familiar with for storing and accessing content, that's like location paths on the internet that point to particular HTTP addresses where the content there could pretty easily be changed from day to day, IPFS uses content addressing instead. 
Um, so this means that you can be sure when accessing an IPFS content ID that you'll receive the exact same piece of content every time and you don't care where that data comes from. So this idea is kind of wild to me when I first started looking at it because it's just such a mind shift from the Web2 world. Um, but it's just also such, a, it's just such a simple and elegant solution as well. So shifting the focus from a location-based address to a content-based ID opens the web to massively distributed storage system. And that's um, where the power of IPFS comes in. Uh, there's heaps of libraries you can get started with IPFS as well. Um, the second part of this puzzle though is that because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, you're kind of relying on nodes if you're not storing uh, this content yourself to altruistically store this content for you. So they're only going to really do that if you maybe pay them, if like it's a piece of content that everyone loves. So we want it, you know, it's cached basically. Um, that's not true, but it's basically at the forefront of everyone. Everyone wants it. So it's getting passed around a lot. Uh, but we've all seen like torrenting and peer to peer systems when it's a piece of content that maybe isn't as popular. Uh, all of a sudden you can't find it. Um, so this is originally uh, where centralized pinning services came from. Um, and I just mentioned the problem with them because these pinning services are centralized. You're putting all, all your eggs in one basket um, and going, well, this pinning service will never go down, but it may well. Um, so this is the point of Filecoin and where it comes into the picture because IPFS uh, content IDs aren't guaranteed to be stored permanently or persistently. Um, so this is, is for, you know, this is where Filecoin comes in. So it's designed to leverage crypto economic incentives that keep this data distributed, reliable, verifiably stored, and also incredibly cheap uh, because it's based on a market in its own right. So it's also as permanent as you want to make it, whether you want to store that data for five minutes or 500 years, that, that is your choice. And it's as resilient as you want to make it. If you want to store it on one storage provider, do not recommend, or, or several, um, that's totally up to you as well. Um, so some of the big talking points here is that, you know, we're using cryptographic proofs that enable smart contract based permanence. And that means it's designed to be as permanent as, as you want it to be, like I said. So it's your data, it's your choice. Um, Filecoin's also designed to be hyper competitive on pricing due to um, its m internal uh, market economics. Um, so there's a whole team that works on the crypto economics of Filecoin and, and how to make that work for both the storage providers and the users. Um, and it's also super scalable. So Filecoin is designed to be internet scalable. Uh, so we're currently the largest uh, distributed storage network. And I think the other week it was 18 million terabytes of data that we've currently got stored, uh, which is a, and uh, also we have the capacity to store uh, almost triple that, I think. So it's about 3% of total cloud storage capacity that's available in our network currently. Um, so it's internet scalable is the point, um, and we're after big data sets that we can really help um, store permanently. Um, so just as a side point, uh, IPFS is storage layer agnostic, so that means you can combine it with the storage layer of your choice, uh, which could be Filecoin, and we think that's a great option, but you can also store um, your data with a centralized cloud storage provider or other decentralized storage solutions as well. So IPFS is really agnostic like that. It's not a blockchain, it's a protocol, whereas Filecoin is the blockchain. And as part of that, it gives the crypto economic incentives to keep storage permanent and, and persistent. And we can verifiably uh, tell you that it's there through our cryptographic proofs. Um, so IPFS and Filecoin fit perfectly together, um, like developers and code terminals or, so, or some other really bad analogy, um, but IPFS is not Filecoin. Um, so hopefully that's been like a really brief and good intro to what IPFS and Filecoin do and how they work together. I'm going to dive into some of the dev tools because that's really what you want to hear about now um, and how you go about using these technologies. Um, so the main use case for uh, 
for Filecoin at the moment is in archiving of data. So what we're doing at the moment is getting big data sets, for example, climate data sets, for example, um, stories on Holocaust survivors. We're working with quite a few uh, social good groups to bring this data onto Filecoin and store this persistently um, for them as well. And by the way, you can encrypt that data before you put it onto um, our network as well. Um, so those are all really cool things that we're doing with big data sets. But there's also lots of opportunities um, to build um, dApps or other parts of the network as well. Um, so I'm just showing a little bit of the Web3 enabled architecture diagram here. And by the way, the logo that's right next to Chainlink is actually the Filecoin virtual machine logo. So that's super exciting because that's going to be bring um, smart contract programmability to combined with our storage network, which is going to be a really awesome. Uh, it's slated for a, an alpha beta release at the end of this year. So um, really looking forward to seeing where that goes as well and how we can interact more with projects after that. Anyway, the dev tools that are currently available. One of my favorite dev tools and one that I, you know, would recommend to literally anyone that is building like a front end app or a dApp um, and then moving it on to a um, Netlify or a Vercel or something like that. Instead of doing that, use Fleek. Fleek is a CICD tool that you can use to deploy those apps for free as easily as you would some of the Web2 tools you're familiar with. Uh, the big difference though is that Fleek uses IPFS to host your site or app and it even offers ENS domain routing on their platform. So I'll take it as a win if all you do is start using Fleek for your front ends. Um, give it a go, super easy. It uses IPFS, uh, which makes it a li little bit more distributed and guaranteed instead of your HTTP routing like the others do. Um, another one of my favorite tools for anyone into NFTs uh, that understands that there's metadata in NFTs, use nft.storage. It's deliberately made easy um, uh, storing of your NFT metadata immutably and permanently. Um, as you may know, uh, this is integral to keeping the main value proposition of NFTs, uh, their non-fungibility. And this is exactly what NFT storage has been designed for. So it stores on at least eight different storage providers. It's totally free because it's a public good and we're funding that. Um, currently uh, t over 25 million, I think it's actually up to 40 million NFTs are stored on nft.storage and it's used by open OpenSea and Magic Eden, to name a few. Um, so this is an industry standard. If you're not storing your metadata on chain, then you need to be using nft.storage. Um, and it's super simple to use. Um, you, you just get an API key and away you go the same way you would with uh, any front end kind of, you know, well, I'm a front end developer. Uh, so if you're using React or JavaScript or something, you just import um, this package and you'll be able to use it pretty much straight away with a few lines of code. So super simple, definitely try that one out. Another one of my favorite ones, uh, it, you know, if you're not using data that is for NFT specifically is Web3 storage. So Web3 storage is, uh, is as easy as nft.storage to use. You in, import the package, um, you get an API key and away you go. Um, Web3 storage is designed for data that isn't just NFT metadata though. Um, so it's designed to give all the benefits of decentralized storage and IPFS content addressing, but with the frictionless experience that you expect with a Web2 kind of storage solution. Um, so if you're building, I don't know, the new Stack Overflow, a blog site, um, you know, maybe some somewhere for people to share content, uh, or uploading other sorts of data sets that you want to keep permanently and immutably, then web3.storage is a good one to check out for you. If you want to do more with our underlying technology, um, if you're like an advanced developer and you you want to really do get into the nitty gritty and do way more, um, and there is more functionality than those three products I just showed or those three dev tools that I just showed you, um, then PowerGate, Textile PowerGate is a really good tool for developers because it's a Docker container wrapped around um, the Filecoin and IPFS nodes. And it gives you a lot more options to configure like minor selections and extend the functionality of IPFS and Filecoin and our other project, Lib Peer to Peer. So check that one out if you want to get a bit more advanced on things. Another experimental tool and the final tool I'll mention is OrbitDB. Um, I'll preface this with a warning, it's still in active development. So it's a good one if you want to start contributing. Um, 
So it's but it's so it's not an ideal solution for users that want like an out of the box experience. But Orbit DB is working on creating a distributed database, which is something that the whole of Web three is kind of crying out for. So. Uh, this is what OrbitDB is working on. Uh, it functions much like a relational database that we might be used to in the Web2 world. Um, and if you're kind of the kind of dev that likes to dip, dip, dig deep on things, then feel free to poke around with this one. There's heaps, heaps more tools out there. They're using IPFS and Filecoin under the hood as well. I know Morales has an IPFS integration. Um, there's Lighthouse Storage, Ceramic as well, which is a, a kind of similar to Textile PowerGate, but using a DID instead. Um, they're also using IPFS and Filecoin under the hood. Um, and just to reiterate, we're super excited for the end of this year where the Filecoin virtual machine will be out um, and it will be EVM compatible as well. So you'll be able to bring your Solidity smart contracts and then, you know, store, um, you know, any data you want right on chain and right in your contracts as well without the costs that you would have with um, Ethereum or Layer 2s. So cool, hopefully I've given you a lot of ideas about um, you know, what, how you could build with IPFS and Filecoin and what it is. Um, there's more, even more ideas you can um, check out on our hackathons.filecoin.io page as well. Um, and there's more resources for you to learn. You can go to Proto School, there's NFT.school, uh, there's obviously our docs and yeah, otherwise just check out our hackathons.filecoin.io program. Uh, web page which has a heap of information on how you can get involved as well and we also have an ambassador program which is called the orbit community um, program so check that out too if you're the type of person that wants to look into being more involved in this otherwise thank you everyone um, i'll leave you with this final quote that the best way to predict the future is to create it which is what you're all doing here now um, so learn long build and